Well, thank you all for being here today. It's uh, exciting to have our third McGovern lecture of the semester as we were able to convert our McGovern lecture into a lecture series to kind of bring in more people, more perspectives. We have also uh, this year sort of used the McGovern as our regular monthly meetings. And so we've been trying to work in a little bit of interesting CHC news uh, when we're doing this. And so before we get to our McGovern lecture day, we're going to have one item of CHC news, which is that somehow we are in the 10th year of our Health Communication Scholars Program. And so this began before there was a Center for Health Communication. And when Jay got here and we founded the Center for Health Com, we already had this program ready to be kind of folded into the Center for Health Communication. Um, so I really want to invite up uh, Renee Daly, who's been leading this as uh, HC uh, Health Com Scholars Program Director for multiple years now. Four We'll, we'll say a few years, yeah. that works, uh, to kind of share a little bit about the program. We have a couple of the teams here to share what they're going to be doing with the funding, which we're really excited about. Uh, but it's a really important part of the way we think about our mission, advancing health communication, in this case, uh, research and training. So, Renee, thanks for thanks for leading the program and being willing to share today. Thank you. Thank you to Mike and the whole CHC team. Um, for allowing us to talk about this program and the start of this McGovern lecture. So as Mike was saying, even before there was a CHC, Mike made this very wise observation that faculty members had these opportunities to get seed grants so that they could go on to get larger grants, but this opportunity wasn't available for graduate students. So he took a teaching grant that he had and created the Health Home Scholars Program. <laughs> and as he said, it was once the CHC was created, it was folded into the CHC under the research arm, and it's been sponsored by the CHC ever since. And he gave me over the reins a few years ago, and I have been really enjoyed working with the, grad, with the graduate student teams on their research. I kind of consider myself the program officer of the, of the team. And the purpose of this, the Health Com Scholars Program is to give graduate student teams experience with grant writing and grant funded research. So in the fall, we host a grant writing workshop in which we bring in faculty members to give all of their insights on the grant writing process, managing grants. So they talk about where to find grants, what types of grants there are, how to structure the proposal, what reviewers are looking for, and then the challenges in manage the, managing the grants once you do get the funding. A lot of the presentations from these faculty members are posted on our website, so there's just a wealth of information about grant writing and grant management on the website for anybody who's interested in getting to know more about grants. And then in the spring, we give graduate student teams uh, a chance to submit proposals to get their health communication research funded. We try to mimic the process of agencies such as NIH and NSF, so people get the experience of creating the proposals in that same structure and all the different elements that go along with those different proposals. And then we get a panel, a panel of faculty to review the submissions and they give feedback on the strength and the weaknesses. And so even if their proposal is not funded, uh, they get one, experience in grant writing, but then two, also great feedback and are encouraged to apply the next year. Many papers come out of these particular projects. So we have a lot of conference papers and publications that are also highlighted on the website. And projects range very, I mean, it's a huge diversity. It's just wonderful creativity by the graduate students in coming up with their proposals, but anything from experiments that are online surveys to interview studies, to uh, working with groups on campus to help and enhance their programs. We even had submissions about uh, research related to a documentary that was giving health information. So just a wide range of proposals. And we broadly define health communication. So there's probably lots of things that you're doing that would fall under the umbrella of health communication research. So I really encourage all graduate students and faculty advisors to check out the program and keep an eye out for the grant writing workshop that we'll be hosting in the fall. We'll probably have announcements about that really early fall in the semester. As I said, I really enjoy working with all the students and their teams and in these different projects and to see how they progress over the year that they have the funding to do their projects. And at this point, I'd like to give the floor over to our representatives of the two teams that were recently funded and so they can give the broad overview, or sorry, the brief overview of uh, their projects and what they'll be doing for the next year. So uh, maybe we'll start with Catherine. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I gave myself a few points so I don't ramble, but um, so I'm working with uh, Tran, who's in the communication studies department, uh, and I'm in the psychology department, um, and we were really interested in exploring the ways that language uh, is shaping beliefs about mental illness, uh, so in particular, thinking about stigmatizing beliefs around mental illness and children's beliefs, um, so uh, that's a really broad, <laughs> um, ambitious goal, but we have two specific goals for this project. Um, one is just to document children's beliefs, so we don't know a lot about what children know about mental illness, so documenting uh, their beliefs, the causes, the consequences, what they associate with different mental illness, both in their peers um, and in adults. And the second goal is to document uh, parents' perceptions of children's readiness for conversations about mental illness and some of the thinking about um, the, the consequences or concerns that parents have about having these conversations. Uh, and I think this is important mainly for two reasons. I guess one is just thinking about, uh, I, there's not a lot of resources out there for parents to think about how to approach these conversations with children. So if we can document what children know and think about about some of the biases and how early they're emerging, but also thinking about what resources parents might need, and then we can use this to think about uh, what information parents need and how we can get that uh, to them to help promote, you know, and uh, safe and supportive conversations around mental illness. Um, so I think that's the broad overview, and I, I'll pass it over to whoever's next. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the information for Catherine and Jacinta's project is down at the bottom here, and then we're going to turn the mic over to Brandon. Hey everyone, my name is Brayden Lazenby. I'm a third year PhD student in communication studies. Um, my colleagues, Alexandra and Mackenzie could not be here today. Mackenzie's actually doing her conference of exams as we speak her defense, so fingers crossed for her. Um, but we're super excited to begin our project, Religion as a Facilitator in the Health Discrimination Framework, keeping with the lovely theme of stigma. We were really interested in how religion may play a role in how um, fat bodies are discriminated against. So we already know in health communication that language plays a huge role in how stigma is perpetuated in society. And it's no secret that fat bodies and obesity is one of the discriminated um, health disparities in the United States. So we want to know how morality language around religion facilitates um, health stigma specifically within um, fat stigma. So our current plan is to do a kind of mixed methods approach with um, survey data, as well as in-depth interviews with people who identify as Christians in the United States to get a better feel of what kind of stigmatizing language are religious groups using in the United States and how that might perpetuate fat stigma. Um, we've been circling around our project with the idea of your body as a temple and how phrases such as that might perpetuate ideas about what the body should look like. Um, so we're really excited to begin this project. We're actually meeting tomorrow to turn in our IRB. And so we're super excited and grateful for the Health Communication Scholars Program to make this stuff possible. Thank you. Look for their research out next year. So we'll have, <laughs> I'm sure conference submissions in the next couple of, well, by, the, by next spring. We also invited the first cohort of recipients of the, these grants to join us via Zoom. So we would love to hear some of the comments that they might have. How do I get them? Uh, I think the one I think we will come up as a speaker if we do this. Like, I'm right. So uh, Sarah Champlin, we have a, a rumor uh, in our internal Slack that you are in the Zoom. Sarah, are you there? I am. <laughs> I am. I, I had to, I jumped through some hoops, but I am here. <laughs> So do you have any uh, words of, of wisdom and reflections on 10 years ago being in that first group? Uh, well, 10, I mean, 10 years. It, it, this, this program was um, the first time I ever really saw the inner workings of a, a grant, a grant and what it's harder than it looks. <laughs> that, that, that's my advice, it, that it's harder than it looks. But no, um, I think for me, the biggest takeaway, the biggest lesson that I learned was working with people in other disciplines is really really awesome and really really fun but also really really hard <laughs> and so that's something that um i continue to to work on that today um i'm associate professor of advertising at the university of north texas and since being i was an assistant professor and now i'm tenured um but i've been funded by nsf and national geographic and i did a lot of consulting work on some nih projects um in that in that time frame um but that is the single most important thing for me was working I, I do that today. I'm working with um, some folks in transportation and geosciences and biological sciences. Uh, my best friend is a fish toxicologist. And just finding that common language, uh, you might have a concept, right? Like even like self or something like that or community engagement. That means so many different things to so many different disciplines. And so 
taking the time to really sit down and have those conversations and see what strengths you bring, but also acknowledge your weaknesses, right? Acknowledge when it's someone else's turn to, to step up and do the hard, the hard stuff that you don't know how to do, um, but you can learn from them. Uh, it, it's so rewarding when it all comes together. Uh, and, but it is, it is, I think, taking that time to reflect on like, what am I bringing to this project? What are the goals of this project? What are our actual research questions and hypotheses? And making sure that everybody is having a say in that room and can have their voice heard and support it is that you're, you might be the PI, right? But you have a team for a reason and everybody's bringing strengths there. And that is just something that I'm in that process right now. That's going to be most of my summer is, is figuring out that common shared language so that we can apply. We're, we're working on some center grant applications through NIH and R1s and, and things like that. And it is like, oh my gosh, that, that sounds, that sounds really hard. That blood draw that you do. I'm glad I'm not doing it, but I'm, I find so much value in that and explain it to me. And then I'll explain my step too. And you know, that, that to me is the hardest thing, but is, is worth taking the time to figure out. But this project and, and the work that we did 10 years ago, it set me in a path of really, really caring and connecting with people and practitioners who are not already in like healthcare, right? So all the other people, all the other ways that we learn about health and pursue health information. And it's important to not forget that like, yeah, healthcare and doctors and, and health communication is important and it happens within healthcare facilities, but it also happens a lot outside of healthcare facilities. And so I was really excited that the, the projects that are funded for this round both address stigma and that is such an, those are really, really important initiatives and endeavors. Um, we are, you're acknowledging something that exists and you're figuring out ways to address something that people might not even understand that they hold, right? It might not even be something that they're doing consciously, but you're addressing that. And I think that that's really, really fantastic work. And I'm so excited to see, you know, what comes from it and following the projects over the past few years has been really rewarding for me. So I appreciate it. I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm on. <laughs> I brushed my hair today, so I don't know if you can see me, but I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sarah. That is so great. And I, she brings up a really great point in the fact that we ask student teams to be interdisciplinary. So one student in Moody and one student outside of Moody. So, and again, that's part of that is because grants are looking for interdisciplinary teams, but also as Sarah's saying, we learn so much more when we're working with people outside of our own field. My contact information is on the website. So if you have any questions at all, please feel free to contact me at any time over the summer when the grant writing workshop is announced. I'm happy to answer any questions, but thank you very much. All right. Well, thanks again, Renee. So I'm really excited. We're never one for big, long, formal introductions. So I'll limit myself just to, I've had a chance working with the Society for Health Communication to meet a lot of great colleagues around the country that I don't think I would have met otherwise. And so when I was thinking about who we can invite in for the McGovern Lecture Series this year, one of my first stops was trying to talk uh, Ashani Johnson-Turbis into coming because I know her background and her history and some things that I thought she could share with our team that'd be really relevant and really different from our first two speakers and the, the fourth person we're still planning on bringing in. So just kind of adding that different kind of array of perspectives and interests and backgrounds. So Ashani, thank you so much for traveling to Austin and being here. We're so excited to hear from you today. Yeah. I'm really happy to be here. I don't think. You all can hear me through this mic. Is that correct? I don't have a really loud voice. It's loud in my head. But, <laughs> um, it's not, I'm told, not particularly loud. Is there a So, number first, thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. I am really excited to be here in Austin, Texas, to talk about what is equity science. We are going to talk about what is equity science, why equity science is important. We are going to talk about inclusive and equitable research methods at the methods of practice for equity science. And we are going to talk about the intersection of equity science, health equity, and big data. And you may ask, why are we talking about big data? The reason why we're going to talk about big data is because an on button will, will help all of that. <laughs> oh, that makes a difference. Excellent. The reason why we're going to talk about big data is a little bit of an excellent. 
Let's try that one with this off and see what happens. Uh, I hope. We'll keep checking. We'll keep checking. Yeah. Okay. The reason we are going to talk about big data is because data is playing an increasingly important role in our lives. And I think that for health equity or for health communications to advance equity, it provides this wonderful new tool that is in our toolbox. So let me first share with you what I want you to get out of this talk. What I hope is that you walk away with an understanding of what equity science is and why it is important. I hope you walk away with knowledge about inclusive and equitable communication methods as an inclusive practice for equity science. And I hope that you walk away with this general understanding of big data and its powers, key powers, and pitfalls related to equity science and health communication to advance health equity. The fourth one that is not on the screen that I hope you walk away with is I hope you walk away energized to use equity science and inclusive and equitable research methods in harmony with your health communication research. My mother, I was talking with her about this yesterday and she gave me this wonderful language. She's like, oh, you want this idea of equity science to power the work people are doing. And I'm like, I like that. Yes, mom, I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> I want it to power or to be used in harmony. So, let me give a little bit of background on um, who I am. You have to hold the mic. I'm sorry. We're getting, have people to, on Zoom are telling us. I, so. can, I can do there it. Put down. No worries. Um, let me give you a little bit of, oh, that makes a big difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of background on who I am and why I'm here and even talking with you about this. My name is Ashani johnson Turbis. I am the Vice President and Director of the Center on Equity Research at NORC at the University of Chicago. I am also the Vice President of the Society for Health Communication. I am a social scientist, a mom, a wife, a runner. I became a knitter during the pandemic and a crocheter. I am a popcorn enthusiast. <laughs> um, and I am committed to advancing equity in every space that I enter. I attended Hampton University. It is a historically black college and university in Hampton, Virginia. I went on to study political science at Purdue University. I got my master's and my PhD from Purdue University. I did a study abroad program at Leiden University in the Netherlands and studying international public policy. And I was a doctoral level scholar, traveling scholar at the University of Chicago where I finished up some coursework before I went back and completed my PhD at Purdue University. I was born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I am the oldest of three and the only girl, eldest daughters unite. <laughs> I, um, I love to travel with my friends and with my family. I, when I was in graduate school, I studied multiculturalism and participatory democracy and deliberative democracy. That was really important. I also studied quantitative methods, although that did not become my jam throughout my entire career. Um, I started my career working at the Chicago Housing Authority. I worked in what was called the Environmental Unit. And so I worked on a program that was focused on abating lead in public housing and also supporting families whose children had tested, um, had high blood, had high levels of lead in their blood. After I left, I moved from Chicago to Georgia and I worked in the Georgia governor's office. And I worked on writing policy papers, white policy papers on a variety of different issues from juvenile justice to rural health issues and kind of ran the gamut. Um, and then I went, worked for 17 years at a management consulting organization where I managed large studies, largely for doing health communication and public health work, largely for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And then I went to NORC and I worked in the public health department. I left NORC for a brief moment to work at McDonald's. Yes, McDonald's. <laughs> I worked in the global communication. I think it was a global center of excellence for communication. I worked there. And interestingly enough, they asked me to come and oversee and direct the data science team and people who were doing social media data analysis. And I am not a data scientist. You will hear me say that more than once during the course of this talk. <laughs> Um, but it was very interesting. I also analyzed or I was monitoring and evaluating um, communication campaigns or campaigns for McDonald's. One of the things they asked me to do one time is like, we need you to evaluate and assess this campaign on the BTS meal. 
that was me. I said, BTS? What's BTS? It's Korean pop band. <laughs> I Googled that. I found out the Korean pop band. But that's the kind of work I was doing at McDonald's. And then I came back to Newark, and um, they were kind enough to take me back and um, lead the Center on Equity Research. So like many of us in the multidisciplinary world of health communication, I learned health communication while on the job. Now what I want to do is I want to share a little bit with you about what we, I call my media diet. And the reason why it's important to talk about a media diet is because I firmly believe that what we are reading, what we are listening to, what we are watching, that it imprints on us, even if only for a moment. It impacts our worldview, how we think about others, how we think about the world around us, how we think about our community. And it also influences our implicit and our explicit biases. That's really important for doing work, the work that I call equity science, right? And also is important for understanding and examining one's own implicit and explicit biases for the work that I hope all of us are doing or will do to advance health equity in our field. I am reading The Measure, which is a book that is all about the measure of life. I am also reading Incarnations because I can't read one book at a time. I'm reading Incarnations, which interestingly enough is about movement through past and current lives. Um, I am reading Everybody Lies, Big Data, New Data, and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are. I am always listening to neo-soul music. And I'm often listening to Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History podcast, and I recently binged watch Never Have I Ever. <laughs> so my work focuses on, let's go to the next slide. My work focuses on embedding inclusivity and equity into the research cycle. So a lot of times when I'm talking about this, I'll say to people, I am, of course, interested in equity as an outcome right? Health equity, economic equity, transportation equity. I'm relatively topic agnostic, but I am most interested in, and our center is most interested in embedding inclusivity and equity into the research cycle, because I firmly believe that if you embed it into how you ask questions, how you collect data, how you analyze the data and then disseminate it and place the lived experience of audiences under inquiry in that research cycle, that that will result in equity, whatever your equity is, or whatever the equity is that you're examining. I am a little obsessed right now with finding the ways and best practices for measuring structural racism. If you have thoughts about that, please share with me. As I've mentioned, I'm very interested in big data as well. So equity is a word that is everywhere right now. It is ubiquitous, right? Um, organizations are setting up equity centers, diversity, equity, and inclusion offices. Um, people are coming up with equity lenses, equity frameworks. The word, it's all over the place, right? I think it is important to unpack and understand what the word is, right? So when I talk about equity science, we're gonna spend some time digging just a moment deep on what is equity and what is science so then I can bring these things together and talk about the transformative work that can be done when you merge them, okay? Um, equity science is new. What that means is if you Google it, you're not gonna find a body of literature out there about it. You're not going to find a bunch of information about inclusive and equitable research methods yet. <laughs> My hope is that in the future that this starts to grow and that people do, and that it becomes a new way to focus scientific research. So keep in mind, this is new. I'm going to break a rule in PowerPoint slides now. It's a lot of text. I'm gonna break the rule a few times. I'm just gonna let people know up front. I'm gonna break the rule. At the core, well, let me back up and say, what I want you to do, this is the definition of equity science. It is the study and practice of efforts to advance equity across social and behavioral science and in the real world. And that last part's really important. When I talked about this with my colleagues, one of the things they said is, it sounds a little ivory tower-ish. It sounds like you're just studying this for the sake of studying it. And I'm like, oh, I do not want to communicate that. This is applied social science research. I want this to influence study and practice in the real world. Notice the bolded words. These are important given that I've given you so much text on the screen. Systematic, 
process to guide, collect, and organize knowledge. This, it's for the scientific generation of knowledge to gather more precise evidence to create and promote equitable campaigns, programs, interventions, and policy. Go ahead to the next slide. So we're gonna spend some time. Oh, did it stop working? I'm hitting the button. Oh. Keep going, I'm gonna keep talking. Thank you, Mike. So this is, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time now, as I said, just talking about unpacking the word. This is a definition um, that I really like. Equity refers to fairness and justice and is distinguished from equality. What I think is, and you can see in here, equity means recognizing we don't all start from the same place and we have to acknowledge and make adjustments to imbalances. This make adjustments to imbalances is really important, right? Because if you look up equity, dictionary.com will tell you it's a noun. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a noun, I think it's a verb. <laughs> It requires action, it requires activity, it is to make adjustments to address imbalances. So when I think about equity in the context of equity science, it is not a noun, it is a verb, it requires action. Here are some other definitions. Notice again, the bolded words. It is the quality of being fair, impartial, fairness, impartiality, freedom from bias, health equity, means the attainment of the highest level of health for all people where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their optimal health. I love this definition. This is adapted from the White House Executive Order. The consistent and systematic, fair, just, and impartial treatment of all individuals, including those who belong to underserved communities. I'm gonna tell you why this is so important. It is in this definition that science starts to creep in. Take a look at it and tell me, do you see where science starts to creep in? It starts to creep in with the word systematic. So let's pivot. I wanna talk about science. So one of the most important things about science is that it is systematic. I wanna start talking about science by talking about one of the world's most known um, and most renowned scientists, Aristotle. You may ask, what has Aristotle got to do with equity? <laughs> there is a theory of, um, there, there's a theory of equity. Aristotle has a theory of equity, but I'm not focusing on that. I want to focus on Aristotle, the scientist for a moment. Aristotle lived in the third century BC and is regarded as the first real scientist, but why? Aristotle was curious. He wanted to understand how the world works, and Aristotle believed that the basis of all knowledge was experience. Explanations are only valid if they are induced or learned by one's experience and observed phenomena. So like we did with equity, let's take a moment and look at some science definitions. Again, I'm continuing to break the rules for a little while for PowerPoint slides but I'm gonna go quickly. Science, knowledge of principles and causes, accumulated and established knowledge that has been systematized. Knowledge, search for truth. Let's keep going. Knowledge or a system of knowledge, systematic knowledge. Science is a system, it's systematic and logical approach to discovering how things in the universe work. I love this definition. This is a recent definition by the Science Council. It is the pursuit and the application of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world following a systematic methodology that is based on science. Equity plus science, this spot right in the middle, that's equity science. Putting the two words together actualizes the very work that I'm talking about doing. It actualizes the systematic conduct of research to gain knowledge and promote what is fair, what is just, what is impartial and free from bias. So let me offer an example of what equity science is not and an example of what equity science is to just drive this point home a little bit. Years ago, I conducted research to create a health campaign to raise awareness about interstitial cystitis. It was research to raise awareness about the condition. 
but it did not examine disparities or inequities. It did not involve hearing from the people who have the condition. It was not focused in any way, shape, or form on addressing the resources they needed or providing changes in the system to provide them the access to care or the care that was needed, but it was health communication research. It was research to understand their knowledge and awareness of their, condi of their condition and the public's awareness of the condition. It was not equity science infused health communication research. By contrast, I worked on a project to create a campaign providing emotional health support and resources to underserved groups amid COVID-19. The team used culturally responsive evaluation to guide the work. The team focused on understanding what were the emotional health support needs for underserved and historically marginalized populations. The team asked questions about what systems and organizations, in this case, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, could do to provide people during COVID the emotional health support they needed to promote resilience. That was health communication research, right? To develop this health communication initiative and campaign, it's called How Right Now, by the way, if you Google it, you'll find it. <laughs> and it was done in beautiful harmony with what we call equity science. So I wanted to provide those just as examples, an example of what it is, and what it is not in practice. Okay, why should I care about this new e-word? We talked about equity is just ubiquitous. It's all over the place, right? So first, health communication science and equity science share a goal akin to health communications broad mandate to advance health equity. Equity science has a mandate to systematically gather evidence and gain knowledge through experience, people's lived experience to advance equity. We should care about equity science for three main reasons. Rigor, action, amends. So number one, it stresses systematic methods and requires exactness and precision to identify and collect information from people and from their lived experience to contribute to work, to develop campaigns, messages and materials to advance equity. Number two, we talked about this, it demands action. It is not only the study, but it is the practice for us to reprioritize opportunities that support eliminating systemic imbalances and barriers for our intended audiences. And this third one can be a little bit more controversial. It requires making amends. I was in an Uber maybe a couple of weeks ago in Chicago and, um, I get in the Uber, first the, the door opens and there's this man and he he says, he sees me and he says my name, he's like Ashani. And I was like, hello. <laughs> and he speaks to me in a language I don't know. He's dressed in beautiful African garb. And he's like, oh, I thought you were by your name and your physical appearance, Nigerian. And I said, no, I'm just plain old American. <laughs> And I said, however, my ancestry.com suggests that I am Nigerian. <laughs> that was enough for him. And it made me immediately his sister, his countrywoman, and his friend. <laughs> so we're talking about this. I'm talking with him about all of this. And he says to me, um, when I, I don't even bring up amends at that time. And he says, as I'm talking about equity science, he says, it's to fix things in the past. It's to, to transform research. And I said, yes, sir, you're all correct. And he says, Ashani, do you know why the constitution is always making amendments? And I said, tell me please, sir. <laughs> and he said, it's because it is consistently trying to redress past injustices. It's trying to make amends. And he's like, that's what your, your, your science is trying to do. And I said, oh, Uber drivers, they are sages. Talk to all your Uber drivers. <laughs> My hope is that equity science becomes a space for interdisciplinary researchers to conduct the research to do this. And then um, infuse your work with rigor, make sure you're taking action and work to, a, to address and meet, am, am I saying the word right? Require amends in the work that you're doing. So my favorite Maya Angelou quote, I say it all the time. Anybody that knows me long enough will hear me say this quote, do the best you can until you know better. Y'all that know it, say it with me. And when you know better, do better. <laughs> Equity science is about doing better science.
Let's talk about inclusive and equitable research. Watch me on time, because here's what I do. I get going. <laughs> All right. I'm okay. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> All right, now that we've talked about what is equity science and why it's important, a reasonable question is, how do I do this, right? Like how, that's, that's important. You've told me what and why, tell me how. So like health communication has methods of practice and includes that includes advertising, social and health marketing approaches and strategies, equity science methods of practice are what we call in our center, inclusive and equitable research. There are several resources that contribute to an understanding of i &E research and methods. This includes work by Patricia Hill Collins, Melanie Nine, Stafford Hood, Kimberly Crenshaw, I've just put some books up here that I think are valuable ones that inform this work, right? Two of the ones that have most contributed probably recently to my understanding and ability to communicate about what equity science is, is Black Feminist Thought. I read this and it blew my mind back in the 90s. <laughs> and what is inclusive research? Patricia Hill Collins work taught me that my story, my experience, my survival as a Black woman, it's not marginal. It belongs at the center also of research and analysis. She made clear the value of grounding scientific research and practice in multiple voices to highlight the diversity, the richness, and the power of those voices. Melanie Nine's work defines inclusive research, and she details the range of approaches that can be used. One thing I noticed, though, when I was recently reading, rereading the first chapter of um, Melanie Nine's book is that she talks about inclusive research and approaches, but nowhere in the first chapter is the word equity used. So to me, this suggested a gap and a place where we can work, and it's a gap to be filled. i &E research is collaborative research that embraces a range of theoretical frameworks and methods focused on democratizing the research process. I'm not gonna read all the words there because you all can read it as this might be the last time I break the rule, I, I hope. Um, i &E research theory and frameworks are often referred to in social science disciplines as participatory, emancipatory, and democratic. There is not one way to conduct inclusive and equitable research. The permutations are extensive, but commonly it relies on qualitative methods, but it can use quantitative methods as well, provided that those quantitative methods are centering the lived experience of the audience that is under inquiry and provided that it is contributing to understanding system changes that need to be made. Based on literature and practice over the past 20 or so years, I have identified what I think are three overarching and key principles of inclusive and equitable research. And then there's some strategies that go with each. So let me take a moment and just talk about these key principles. Number one, examine your positionality and engage in self-reflection. This means that you acknowledge who you are, your position of privilege or disadvantage and think about how it can influence your collection and interpretation of data. Some key ways and strategies to do this. Have culturally diverse teams that support each other in seeing each other's blind spots. Dangerous biases can be prevented with the addition of broad perspectives. We know that there is danger in a single story. So make sure you have people around that have multiple stories to contribute to filling your own blind spots. Ask your teams to engage in self-reflection, either individually or if it feels like a safe space, do so as a team to identify what are your implicit biases or explicit biases that may influence the work that you're doing. Make sure to include research questions about how inter intended audiences' intersectional identities influence their lived experience and how they potentially could receive messages, materials, and health communication messages. I'll repeat that word again. Um, make sure that you include that and think about intersectional identities. Conduct work that centers culture and engages community. We have talked about that. Um, for example, let me give concrete examples. Build community advisory boards, interview community members, Throw data parties with community to look at the data together. Um, 
I want to acknowledge here something that's really important. And that is that doing this kind of work using inclusive and equitable research as the method of practice for equity science, it takes time, right? It takes more time to engage communities before, during, and after. And it also can be more expensive. I think it is important for you to know, and as you're working with funders potentially as well, for people to go in eyes wide open about this. It takes more time. It oftentimes may cost more money to do exemplary equity science in harmony with your health communication research. Honor cultural context by doing the work to describe culture and community, conduct needs assessments, do environmental scans, hold focus groups, all of those things. I'm wanting to give you specific concrete things. Democratization and systems focus. This principle three means that you focus on shared, you share your learnings with audiences and stakeholders, and you also include focusing on system change. So with regard to sharing plans, share plans for data collection and results with intended audiences before, your planning stage, during and after, all across the process, and examine and seek to influence systems versus focusing just on individual behaviors. This means, for example, understand, seek to understand in your health communication research that is powered by equity science, right? Seek to understand how inequities are embedded in systems and in policies, right? Not just in one's individual behaviors. Health communication research, oftentimes we're looking at uh, individual or a group's knowledge and their awareness and their behavioral tension, behavioral intentions, their beliefs and behaviors. Instead of focusing on the individual, think about what's around the individual and that system. So for example, you want to make, you want, you're like Ashani, I want you and people in your community to eat more fruits and vegetables and I want you to exercise. I want to raise your awareness about the importance of doing that. I know it's important. <laughs> Do I have sidewalks I can walk on in my neighborhood? Do I have grocery stores in my neighborhood that sells um, fresh fruits and vegetables? Those are things in my environment that are in my system that are in the structure, right? Versus just my individual behavior. So ask questions that allow you to dig deep on those sorts of issues and identify things to, I'm gonna harken back to why it's important to address and make amends for past wrongs if, if, if that is, appropriate in that particular case. So other INE strategies include using culturally responsive and eva um, equitable evaluation, pay people for their lived experience. Let me say it again, y'all, pay people for their lived experience and their contribution to your work and co-author, include them in co-authorship lines as well. So some concrete tips. I've already talked about this a little bit, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. Work to ensure diverse teams. I mentioned that, right? Help people help address gaps that exist. So let me just share this, for example, right? I have intersectional identities, but I also have gaps. I am Black. I am female. I am now middle-aged. <laughs> I am dark, right? All of these things contribute to who I am, but there's things I am not. I'm not gay. <laughs> I didn't grow up in a rural area. I have gaps. And so I want to fill my team and put people around me that can help me see my own blind spots and address that, right? Identify a foundational theory or framework that is grounded in center and culture. Culturally responsive and equitable evaluation is a great multi-step framework to do that. And craft research questions that force examination of systems. We talked about that as well. A final tip. Identify and use data that provides you enough observations to identify meaningful patterns and trends in targeted geographical areas. An example of this is big data. That last statement, that is my gentle transition into talking about big data. <laughs> Am I good on time? 10 minutes, okay, I can do it, thank you. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, you may be wondering, why are we talking about big data? So, um, and why am I talking about this connection? Okay, before I talk about the connection, first I want to say, I wanna set expectations for my own expertise. Please don't ask me any questions about coding. <laughs> Being passionate about something, and I'm passionate right now about big data as a new tool in our toolbox, doesn't mean you know everything about this. I got this off Instagram, y'all. It means that you're always excited to learn about it. That's me, I think, in this in the big data sea. I know 
that I have passion about it. I am interested in new ways and new data to study human knowledge and awareness and beliefs and behaviors and, and social interactions as well. Big data is an explosion of information that is now available to us to do this. So to talk about big data, let me be clear and let's define it. As I said, I'm a social scientist, not a data scientist, but I do know and I understand that there is data and there is big data, <laughs> okay? A clear big data definition can be hard to pin down because it is inherently a vague concept due to the question of how big is big? Is 19,000 observations big, but 18,999 small, <laughs> right? Um, I understand this conundrum with regard to understanding big data, but I believe that it's important to have a working definition, especially for non-data scientists like me. So the Artificial Intelligence Podcast, if you get an opportunity, go listen to the Artificial Intelligence Podcast, <laughs> says that big data refers to sets of data that are so large and complex that data processing software products cannot capture, cannot manage, and cannot process that data in a reasonable amount of time to mine the data for appropriate insights. Some examples of big data are the New York Stock Exchange. Um, that generates about one terabyte of new trade data per day. Paul Wesson, in an article from 2022, and his colleagues have identified some big data specifically related to health biospecimens, health records, community satellite sensors, administrative records, mobile phone data. Big data that is commonly used by persons in our field includes social media data, Facebook data, Instagram data, and, um, and the internet as well, Google Trends data. I keep encouraging like my colleagues, I'm like, hey y'all, let's dig into the Google Trends data. Um, I don't know exactly how to do it yet, but I'm gonna figure it out because I have passion <laughs> um, as stated. So let me keep going. Historically, big data has been characterized by three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. Volume is the breadth and the depth of data. Velocity is the speed of data accumulation. It's fast, right? And oftentimes the speed is close to the time of data collection. Variety is the type of data that is unstructured or structured, right? I think that attention to just the three Vs is not enough for those of us that are doing work to advance equity and that want to center equity in our health communication and other research. For that, we need three more Vs, all right? We need veracity, the trust word, we need to be attentive to the veracity, the truthfulness of the data and the trustworthiness of the data for the questions that are asked, the value, the decision-making potential of that data, and I love this one, virtuosity, the role of scientists to use equity and justice frameworks to organize the data and create solutions to mitigate bias in data and interpretation. So yes, big data has volume and it moves fast, but those of us that are committed to doing equity-focused research must also embrace that it is data that could tell the truth, veracity, it can drive fast decisions, right? Uh, what did I have, uh, value, <laughs> and it can foreground bias and inequities by zooming in, for example, on areas where inequity exists, virtuosity. Let me bring equity science, health communication with a focus on its mandate to advance health equity and big data together. Some animation for y'all. <laughs> right there at that star. Equity science requires that we study and we practice advancing equity by asking certain questions, thinking about power imbalances as well, systematically connect, collecting and analyzing data um, that is inclusive and puts lived experience at its center. I've said that multiple times. As mentioned, the broad mandate of health communication is to improve population outcomes and achieve equity. Big data offers this vast new type of information on humans that was previously unknown. Now, having said all of that, let me just keep going a little bit. Oh, before I go to powers and pitfalls, I wanna take a moment and just 
address a question at least I had for myself, which is why now, right? Big data and health communication as a discipline have been around since the 90s and my children tell me that that was a really, really long time ago, <laughs> right? It's been around since the 90s. So why now? Now, because there is an increased and overdue attention to structural inequities. Now, because there is a renewed focus on advancing health equity and data has an increasingly important role in our lives. Why now? Now, because survey rates, survey participation rates are declining and it is becoming more difficult in a struggle to get diverse samples. That is really, really important for doing equity-centered work, for doing equity science. But we now have this new type of data in exabytes and terabytes, I learned those new words, <laughs> to help us do that, okay? Having said that, it's not perfect. So let's talk, let's take a moment and talk about some powers and pitfalls. I have identified what I think are two key powers of big data in the space of equity science and doing health communication research to advance equity and two key pitfalls. So number one power, it is unfiltered data. Um, I used the language when I was presenting this to some of my colleagues and I said it was truth serum. And one of my colleagues was like, oh, that kind of gives me hives that it's a truth serum because, you know, is it really? Sometimes it's wrong. People lie. On Facebook, I might say, you know, I'm really happy and I had a really great Mother's Day, but you know, I might be like really irritated that my children didn't come and pay enough attention to me, right? So you're, it's not always presenting the truth. We tend to present our best, best selves, but big data as unfiltered data, let's say, allows us to see, to see what people really know, what they want and what they do. So people may, for example, hide embarrassing thoughts. They may hide their racial animus, their racism, their sexism, online, but their internet searches and sometimes their anonymous online conversations and their bio specimens, that speaks the truth, right? That is unfiltered data and ideally we think true. <laughs> um, the other power of big data is that it allows the opportunity to zoom in, right? Because you're getting so much data. It allows, it's, it's, so, it's such large amounts of data even in small subsets and populations that we can zoom in on geographies with hundreds of millions of observations in a location. We can spot patterns that may exist in cities and in towns and in neighborhoods, right? So it gives us that power to zoom in. Two key pitfalls or problems with big data. It may exacerbate inequities if people are not present in the data. There are widespread concerns about minimal attention to inclusion and representation in big data, such that it's not capturing data on people in some groups, people who have low incomes, people who live in rural areas, people who may have poor cyber infrastructures that it can result in discrimination and underrepresentation in the data. The problem or the pitfall is when those people are not present in the data and that is called data absenteeism. They're absent, right? That's a pitfall and that's a problem, particularly for those of us that are doing work to center equity. The second is that it may represent conscious or unconscious bias. Data represents conscious and unconscious bias of researchers who can miss who can ignore or who can undercount people, particularly people in, who are previously or who are cons considered invisible or undesirable or unfavorable. Let me give, uh, consider for a moment an example, the census. The census systematically undercounts people. In large part, this was due to interviewers who feared going into certain neighborhoods where people of color resided to gather the data. So thus, that big data that is the census data, it missed the groups and unfair policy or unjust policy decisions may have been made based on that data, right? So we gotta watch out for that pitfall of bias in data and data absenteeism. Let me say a little more before I do that part. 
I want us to remain vigilant. Those are not the only problems and pitfalls with big data. Those are the two that I've identified as key and important ones in the space of equity science used in harmony with and to power health communication research. But I want all of us to remain vigilant in spotting potential problems as you work to harness the power of big data without hubris and without overstating the claims of the data in our communication research. Big data is not going away. So let me hearken back to the very beginning of this talk and share. Big data is now a new tool in your communica health communication research toolbox to use and to use wisely and to use responsibly. I wanna give a special thank you to these colleagues that you see on the screen that did a wonderful job offering me great feedback and constructive criticism as I was developing this talk. Um, it includes all of these folks. And then there is a group that folks may be interested in looking at some of their scholarship called Big Data for Health Equity. And they were kind enough to let me present equity science to them as well and give me some feedback. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you for listening. And now let's talk. Well, I think we can all see why Ashani was very high on my list of people I wanted to bring to Boston. I see a lot of nods in the room. Uh, we were behind the scenes talking about the idea of sort of health come research powered in harmony with uh, equity science. So I think you coined some new terms that we're going to be using internally quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> we're almost the end of our noon time. And so what I would love to do is one, just say thank you again. And also let folks on the Zoom know that we have one more McGovern lecture coming. Uh, if you can save the day and time, it's being May 15th at 2 p.m. And we'll be publicly sharing the, the speaker and the details once we finalize the room and a couple of logistical things. So you'll be seeing an announcement from that pretty soon. But really want to say thanks to everyone, especially on the Zoom, who might be leaving the Zoom room very quickly for noons because everyone on Zoom doesn't even take breaks to care for themselves. Uh, <laughs> but just want to say thank you all very much. I will stick around with the room here in a little bit and talk. And if people have questions, we can hang out and, until we eventually have to get Ashani back to the airport so you can you know, get home. So thank you again so much. And thanks everyone who was here online. So thank you very much.